we're going to be talking about healthy and unhealthy relationships. And I'm going to be sharing with you 10 major things that makes a relationship to either be healthy or unhealthy. Permit me to start with talking about healthy relation unhealthy relationships. Uh, we're going to be talking about 10 things that makes a relationship to be unhealthy. 10 things that makes a relationship to be unhealthy. So I'm going to be hitting the ground running because we have limited time. Number one, number one, uh, listen, write this down. Uh, number one that you're having on your board is not the number one that I'm going to be giving to you because I kept that as my joker. Is that right? So here is the number one of number one. <laughs> here is it. It is. The first sign that a relationship is unhealthy the first sign to show that the relationship is sick the first symptom that the relationship is unhealthy is that the partners involved begin to strategically avoid themselves period the first sign that your relationship is unhealthy the first symptom to show that you have malaria it is for some persons you shiver some there are other symptoms your temperature rises okay so when a doctor sees a combination of some symptom the doctor says say, you know what you have malaria he says well you know you have COVID is that okay when they see shortness of breath and they see you have congestions and and they see that you are struggling to breathe and and there are other little symptoms they can use and say oh you know what from what we are seeing this is symptomatic of COVID, okay? In the same vein, how do you know a marriage or a relationship that is sickly, a marriage or relationship that is unhealthy, even though the partners involved appear to still be married? Number one, they strategically avoid themselves you know the man has a way of avoiding his wife the woman has a way of avoiding her husband the, the film strategically begins to avoid meetings we avoid talking we avoid embracing for those of you who are married we avoid intercourse so there is the avoidance once your relationship has entered into an avoidance mode hey let me say let me tell you this i don't care to know how many angels are surround you i don't care to know the number of gallon of oils that you use to anoint yourself i honestly don't also care to know who is the prophet that lays hands on you if your marriage is already in an avoidance mode everything i'm about to mention the next 10 things i'm about to mention will be found in your relationship hey by the way once your marriage relationship is in an avoidance mode it's a matter of time the relationship will end in a breakup the marriage will end in a divorce it's a matter of time i guarantee you that let's look at some of the major signs that a marriage is already suffering uh what we call uh an unhealthy uh situation a marriage is sick a marriage or relationship is already sick. What are some of the signs? Number one, there is what we call inhibited personal or career growth. When your growth, your personal growth in a relationship, when you are no longer allowed to grow, the marriage, the relationship does not create room for you to grow as a person, to grow socially, to grow psychologically. To even grow philosophically, somebody's telling you the kind of books you must read and the books you must not read. So your philosophical exposure is limited by virtue of the fact that your relationship inhibits, limits the growth of you personally, mentally, spiritually. Someone will not allow you to go to church. Someone will not allow you to pray. Someone will not allow you to fellowship with Christians. Someone will not allow you to, to watch live streaming. Such a person is inhibiting your growth. Spiritually, you're not allowed to grow. You can't read your Bible. You can't pray. You can't fast. All right? You want to go for a program. Somebody tells you no. You, you, you want to join people to pray together. Somebody tells you no. All right? It's very, very dangerous. You, you want to attend a course. No. Your partner doesn't support your growth. It is an unhealthy relationship. All right? Number two, take note of this. Extreme possessiveness and jealousy. Extreme possessiveness 
and jealousy. I expect your partner to be to have some level of jealousy over you. I mean, you cannot love your partner and not exercise some level of jealousy, you know? Like, for instance, uh, I mean, I, I, if I just see a, everybody hugging you and all of that, there should be a little bit of something that say, hey, you know, you can't give everybody everything, you know? So, uh, but, but not in an unhealthy way. But there's something we call extreme jealousy. There's something we call extreme possessiveness. Where somebody, somebody totally surrounds you, creates what we call boundaries around you, limits you from interacting with others, never lets you take pictures with others without bringing you into a state of trouble. You can't take picture, you can't take pictures with your colleagues in the office, you can't even take picture with your group members in the church without a wife or husband calling you to say, whoa, but, but, but why were you leaning your shoulder on that man? Well, that, that man in the picture, your choir master, well, why were you leaning on him? Why did you raise your two fingers? Why did you point at him? Is that okay? Uh, okay, so why did you keep your shoulder on the person's uh, your elbow on the person's shoulder I, I don't understand why was it that you were winking your eye on the <laughs> all right extreme possessiveness is a very dangerous thing in relationship if you have children they want to marry make sure they ask these questions have your heart been broken before has somebody cheated on you before if you are single ask those questions not just do you have a job where do you work how much is your money how much do you make in a month those are fantastic questions to ask but beyond that has your heart been broken before have you been cheated upon before if yes have you healed are you all right how about if you see me interacting with people how are you going to feel i'm going to be a public figure i mean i hope that you're going to be comfortable with that all right you want to make sure that you don't take anything for granted number three write this down very quickly you want to make sure that the person is not consistently threatening or intimidating you. Any relationship where there's consistent threats and intimidation, such a relationship is an unhealthy one. Any little thing, your husband is either threatening you to pack out of my house, get out of my house, I don't want to see you again, or you are in relationship. Any little thing, the guy calls you and tells you, sorry, I think I am done. He's been done almost 10 times in the last three weeks, all right? And, and then somehow you all come back again. Any relationship where you see elements of threats and elements of intimidation, you should know that such a relationship is an unhealthy one. Number four, when there is a situation in a marriage or relationship where one partner makes senseless and unreasonable demands, one of the signs that your relationship is unhealthy is that one person always makes senseless on an unreasonable demand. Let me make a little joke here. Imagine that my wife is asking me now to grow tall. That is not only senseless, it is reckless. I mean, how do you expect me at this age to begin to grow tall? I mean, like how? One of the major reasons why relationships are unhealthy is that partners make senseless and unreasonable demands. It, it can go on and on. Making your partner to respond, you are trying to force your partner to respond uh, concerning something that your partner has no capacity for response. Something your partner's never done before. Something your partner's not exposed to. And I'm not talking about teaching your partner. I'm saying you're expecting your partner to step up to the game when your partner doesn't even know how and doesn't even have capacity for that. Let us take it to the next level, number five. Where you harbor resentment and unforgiveness. Let me say this. One of the major destroyer of relationships one of the major things that destroys relationships are individuals who have become reservoirs of unforgiveness it's a terrible language to use but it's an unfortunate expression for individuals who are married but they harbor such things and it happens to men it happens to women you are in relationship with your partner but you are a deep-seated reservoir of unforgiveness and resentment you resent Sent your partner inside you are unforgiven and it's amazing how that you go to God on a daily basis that is the highest level of hypocrisy 
on earth. Let me be very frank with you. I, I don't honestly, I don't care to know if you're a bishop, you are a pastor, you are a pope. I respect you. I honor you. I don't care to know if you're a worship leader. I don't care to know if you are, uh, you, are a, you are somebody that builds churches, you give churches money. If you harbor resentment and you harbor unforgiveness, your religion is bought in vain. The fundamentals of Christianity have been violated by your practice. If there's somebody you need to forgive, walk up to them today and tell the person you offended me big time but I, I let it go I let it go the person doesn't really need to ask you for forgiveness to be forgiven please can I say that again the person doesn't really need to ask you for forgiveness before you give it to them the kind of forgiveness God gives to us is the one that is given before we ever ask for it asking for it makes us appropriate it but God is not waiting for you to ask before he gives Stop allowing yourself to be imprisoned by other people's offense by saying if he doesn't come to ask me for it on bent dead knees, I will never forgive him. Well, you have just imprisoned yourself. Number six, highly suspicious and distrustful partner. If your relationship has so much of high level of distrust and suspicion, it's going to be an unhealthy relationship. I've not found a relationship that is healthy where there's high level of distrust and suspicion. Your relationship cannot be healthy if the level of distrust and suspicion is very high. The level of suspicion in your body is, is high. You have high level of suspicion. It's deep on the inside of you. It's time to let it go. Otherwise, it's going to make your relationship unhealthy. Totally disrespectful and dishonorable. When you are in a relationship that is totally disrespectful, where there's so much disrespect and there's so much dishonor, an environment like that, that is totally dishonorable and disrespectful, is unhealthy for relationships to thrive. When your relationship is so much infected with disrespect and dishonor, such a relationship will not thrive. You disrespect each other, you dishonor each other. Such a relationship cannot be healthy. Number eight, that relationship is filled with what I call dangerous abuse and criticism. You dangerously abuse each other and you dangerously criticize each other. Such a relationship cannot be healthy. Emotionally, verbally, sexually, physically, financially, you abuse each other. You are critical of each other. It cannot be healthy. Such a relationship cannot be healthy. Number nine. Any relationship where there's high level of manipulation and deceit, manipulation is the of the highest order is in the relationship the wife is manipulating the husband the husband is manipulating the wife they are very deceitful everybody's deceitful in the family you know jacob is manipulating laban laban is manipulating jacob and then uh, and rachel is lying to jacob jacob is also lying to her father you know just a manipulative and deceitful environment it's an unhealthy environment for relationships to thrive in you cannot have a healthy relationship where the both parties are deceitful and manipulative. You cannot have a healthy relationship in such an environment. Lastly, you cannot have a healthy relationship where there is the partners involved, one of them or all of them, are personally Christless and godless. You can't have a healthy relationship in an environment where the individuals are Christless. Amazing. We've been talking about uh, the 10 major signs that a relationship is unhealthy. All right? And uh, that's just uh, some of the things you can use to know that, hey, you know what? My relationship is unhealthy. Yesterday, uh, I felt really touched, and I don't intend to mention your name, but I saw that you were online. And you did stated that all the 10 signs I mentioned were in your relationship 
and that that marriage has ended up now in a divorce. And I want to thank everybody online, those who were around you. I noted that they were sending you words of comfort. But that is to tell all of us who are still married that there's somebody amongst us. I mean, that's not the only one I saw her comment. I don't know what other person said. But she said, Pastor Sam, all the signs you have mentioned were in my relationship. And ultimately, it led to the demise of that relationship. It is a major warning to all of us. If you're in a relationship and the 10 major things I mentioned are already finding expression, one, two, three, four, they are increasing in number in your relationship. Like I said yesterday, it doesn't really matter who anoints you with oil. It doesn't matter what mantle. You can even take one from the prophetic prayer altar. I expect you as someone who is on this altar to be very different in your marriage. I expect your relationship to be better because you are not only praying for breakthrough, you are properly educated on how to manage relationships. So go back again and listen and watch the 10 major signs of unhealthy relationship and your commitment is to ensure that those things don't find expression in your life. With those few words, I want to welcome you to the Relationship Masterclass today. My name remains Sam Oe, and it absolutely gladdens my heart to connect with you on this platform today. Well, right about now, I intend to move straight away into what we have to deal with today. We're going to be talking about, you know, the 10 major signs of healthy relationships. The 10 major signs that shows us that a relationship is healthy. So may I humbly request of you to share the video now uh, so that we can run straight into it. And I want you to quickly get your writing materials. Like I encouraged you, I did say that you should get a relationship journal so that you can actually keep this information with you. I may not continue to share all those things because my schedules can get a little bit busier sometimes. And as a result of that, what you're having now, you may not have me doing that. But if you keep note, you can always keep me with you and say, hey, Pastor Sam wants to talk about communication. And you go back to your relationship journal and you're able to go through and find wisdom to guide you in the times that you find yourself in. You may also want to talk with your kids. So you, all you need to do is photocopy it and hand it over to your children. I, I believe in technology, but sometimes the challenge with technology is that your phone can crash. A new set of phones can come out and then you find out that you have challenge of either transferring or you, you know, crash and all kinds of stuff. All right. So you never go wrong writing. They said writing makes an exact man. Would you write that down? Writing makes an exact woman. All right. So let's get started today. Uh, as you share, I'm going to be talking about healthy relationships and the 10 major signs of healthy relationship invite your friends in the office they've complained to you they have problem with their relationship your brother and his wife are having challenges your sister and her husband are having challenges uh, you know a family in your neighborhood that is having challenges or in the office business relationship uh, office relationship workplace relationship marketplace relationship where you have those challenges there are a few things you're going to learn from here that will help you to improve the health status of your relationship listen carefully to this a healthy relationship is very very critical to sustaining the atmosphere for a successful marriage or any kind of relationship a healthy relationship creates a sustainable atmosphere for individuals to coexist together a healthy relationship creates the environment for two individuals or more to be able to relate together, to be able to connect, to be able to communicate and have, have the very best of their times together, uh, whether it's in a marriage relationship, whether it's in a couple's relationship, single's relationship. Once there's health, if it is healthy, everything will work. So because of our time, 
let's get down to the very first sign of a healthy relationship. The very first sign that a relationship is healthy. Number one is that you connect with one another. Relationships that are healthy fosters connection. Relationships that are healthy, they foster connection. Wherever there is healthy relationship, you will always find connection. What that means is that individuals don't avoid each other. Remember what I told you yesterday. One of the major signs that your relationship is unhealthy is that you avoid each other. You avoid one another. Husband avoid wife. Wife avoid husband. And we do that strategically. We do that manipulatively and deceitfully. And like I said, only a fool will be fooling someone and think that you are the only person that is wise. All right? So never forget this. Avoidance is a sign that a relationship is not healthy. Connection is a proof that relationship, relationships are healthy. Wherever you see health, you will see connection. Wherever a body is healthy, you find everything working together. It is normally when there is infirmity, sickness in the body, you find that a part of the body doesn't function in harmony with the other parts of the body. So never forget that the proof of health in a relationship is that the parts of the body functions together everything functions together you deliberately build emotional bridges in a healthy relationship you build emotional bridges is that okay you don't avoid each other physically all right you build emotional bridges amongst yourselves it's critical to note that wherever there is a healthy relationship the parties involved build what we call emotional bridges they intentionally work together they intentionally work together so there is connection all right and where there is connection we intentionally work together we close relationship gaps Yes, we intentionally work together to close relationship gaps. It's, it's important to note that, that wherever there is connection, one of the major things that happens is that we don't avoid each other physically, all right? Number two, we also ensure that we build emotional bridges. We don't separate ourselves emotionally. We try to make sure we foster that sense of connectivity so emotionally we are bridged up. All right? Permit me to use that English. Emotionally we are bridged up. Okay? And intentionally we work together to ensure that we close relationship gaps. We try to avoid drifting apart. We do all that we can within our powers to ensure that we don't drift apart. It's very, very important if we're going to have sustainable relationships. Very, very powerful. Number two, number two, you communicate with one another. You communicate with one another. In a healthy relationship environment, people communicate with one another. Husband communicates with wife. Wife communicates with husband. And one of the most amazing things is that there are three things that happens in such an environment. They speak. They listen. And then they negotiate. These are three things you will find in a healthy communication environment where there is communication and it is healthy you find that we are given permission to speak the husband gives the woman the right to speak the woman gives the man the right to speak her thoughts her feelings speak her desire speak her interest so it's critical to know that one of the things you find in a healthy uh, relationship is that the individuals have given each other the right to speak, okay? And when I give you the right to speak, I do not interject, interrupt. I do not interfere when you are still expressing your thoughts. I give you the right 
to verbalize your feelings. I give you the, the right to verbalize your desires, your, your, your emotions. I give you the right to verbalize that. And so that means I give you the right to speak, okay? Even if I differ, I take note and then after I re-engage with you, all right? Except where you are beginning to drift away uh, because of a wrong assumption, then you may be helped to be uh, brought back in alignment with the actual spine of the conversation so never forget that it is critical to always remember that in a healthy environment where there is communication the parties involved they talk they speak with one another nobody's intimidated not to speak okay number two they listen yes they listen to one another the husband listens to the wife the wife listens to the husband uh the fiance listens to the fiance the fiance listens to the fiance so it's important to understand that listening is one of the major hallmark of a healthy relationship you listen to one another you speak you listen and then lastly you negotiate all right you negotiate meaning we come to a point of compromise and there is nothing wrong with compromise and in in the place of compromise in the place of negotiation we may have a situation whereby what you said is what we will do all right or we can have a situation whereby what i said my idea may be what we will embark upon on the other side, we can have what we call an hybrid idea. What that means is that a little from your idea, a little from my idea, will bring it together to create what we call our idea, all right? Our solution, our approach, our methodology, all right? So we'll bring all of that together and that becomes our approach, our methodology, our solution, our decision concerning that matter now negotiation is what makes that possible it is therefore critical to know that in an atmosphere of health relationships actually allow uh, individuals to create the room for the other party to speak listen and negotiate write that down that's very very important you speak you listen and you negotiate you speak you listen and you negotiate. Very, very powerful principle when it comes to relationship. Never forget that. Number three, number three, you trust one another. There's another powerful secret when it comes to, uh, you know, creating a healthy relationship environment. You trust one another. Yes. What that means is that you don't give each other the reason to doubt, distrust, and disbelieve yourselves. All right? I'm going to say that again. You trust one another. This is one of the major keys to having a healthy relationship. You trust one another. And in trusting one another, what you don't do is that you don't give each other the reason to doubt, to disbelieve, to distrust your commitment or your commitment to the vows and the promise that you made to the relationship or to the other party. You don't do anything that creates doubt, that creates disbelief or distrust, all right? You don't create it. There are some individuals who naturally are distrustful, but you don't give them the ammunition that is required to actually power that weakness in them. Don't forget what I just said right now. There are individuals who have a natural proclivity, natural propensity towards uh, what you call distrust, all right? Because of their history, it predisposes them to act as such, all right? They've gone through some things in the past. They've gone through some betrayals and all of that. So naturally, either by virtue of the environment they grew up in, the experiences that they've had, the exposures, and sometimes the education. For, some, for instance, someone who has been educated as a criminologist, all right, who is trained to always question what he sees. Uh, such a person may have a low level of trust when it comes to relationship. Not in all cases, but in some cases, education can affect trust, all right? So here's the point I'm making. 
whether it's by environment, experience, education, or exposure, if an individual has distrust tendencies, tendencies towards distrust, the person has a proclivity towards distrust, a propensity towards distrust, what you don't do is that you do not become the trigger that actually activates that natural tendency or tendencies. Your assignment is to walk away from anything that will actually lead to triggering that weakness in the person. It's critical to take note of that. That we must learn to trust in a relationship where there's health, we trust one another. We never violate the vows that we made to one another. We never violate the trust that we make to one another. If for any reason you violate the trust, you break the trust, it's a hard work, but trust me, it's not an impossible work to make sure that you find your way back to rebuilding the bridges in your relationship again. So it's critical. It's critical. I see some of you already tagging your friends. God bless you. This is really amazing. I've not even asked you to share yet and you're already doing the right things. All right, so can I give you just the next few minutes now? Why don't you go ahead and share the video? Why don't you tag three, four, five of your friends and just say, hey, you know what? I want you to join us right now. Or sometimes they may even get to watch it later. So would everybody go ahead right now, tag your friends, share the video. Let Because trust me, I'm sure you're already getting value for your time. But it's going to get deeper. You know, once I get to number five, I will switch the gear. All right? So I'm already giving you appetizers now. It's going to get a little more trickier very shortly. So why don't you just reach out to anybody you care about and let them come and join us right now in the broadcast. All right? I am also trying to do the same because I think um, I need to quickly do that so that some of my, my close people can uh, be partakers of what is going on. All right. Here we go. Join us now. Very good. Okay, though. So never forget this. I've already mentioned three things that depicts and exemplifies three things that shows you that the relationship is healthy. Number one, I made it clear that there is connection between individuals, all right? Uh, healthy relationship focus more on connecting, all right? On healthy relationship focus more on disconnecting. Can somebody write that down? Healthy relationships focus more on connecting. Unhealthy relationships focus more on disconnecting. Ta-da! Something hits you when I mention that. Watch this carefully. I just spoke Latin. Okay? All right. So we said in every relationship, it first of all begins with individuals. The building block for every relationship, first, individuals. Then, the relationship. All right? Then you have what we call the marriage. And right on top of it, you have the family. And of course, you have society. All right? This is the building block. Please take note of this. If the individual is healthy, please, I want to open your eyes to what's going on in relationships now. How do you know whether an individual is healthy or not? Any partner anybody in a relationship that you are in if you're in relationship with anybody and you notice that the person always wants to move away from you drift drifting is indicative that the person you are in relationship with is an unhealthy person the person is emotionally unhealthy please take note of this this is let's say this is sam this is Mary, okay? Watch this carefully. How do you know that Sam is unhealthy emotionally? Mary is moving this way towards Sam, but watch this. Sam is moving away, either covertly or overtly. What that means is that Sam is either intentionally or strategically or un unaware. Sam is drifting, okay? So we call this the drift effect. Mm? so sam is constantly pulling away pushing away moving away mary is coming sam is moving 
The problem with such a relationship is that it will get to a moment whereby the one who is pursuing will get frustrated, okay? And at such a moment, the person stops pursuing. And now the gap, because of the drifter, the drifter in the relationship keeps drifting. What that does is that it widens the gap between the parties. So there's a moment where we are together. Yes, we may be married, but we don't feel anything for each other. We don't care about each other. Why? We've drifted emotionally. We began to get used to not caring for each other. We began to get used to not sharing with one another. We began to get used to not talking with one another, not connecting. We're drifting. So what we're doing is in every drift, you are re-educating your partner to practice independence instead of interdependence. Can I say that again? In every drift, what you are doing is that you are educating your partner in the art of independence. Relationship is not a place for independence. Relationship is a place for interdependence. So when you begin to drift, you can't, I'm coming, you're moving. You are almost like a mirage. You are like a vapor. The closer I get to you, the farther you go from me. All right? Uh, where is my beloved? I go through the streets and I search for her. I cannot find her. That is one who is pursuing sons of Solomon. All right? He said, I'm seeking for the one whom my soul loved. He went into description. Her cheeks are as raw. Her teeth are like this. And her eyes are like that. And her breasts are like I'm seeking for her whom my soul loved. The watchman found me again. You see, later, the reason why they both connected, both the one seeking and the Adulamite, the reason why they connected was that whilst the man was seeking her, watch the direction of the arrow, whilst this was pursuing, she was also pursuing. So they find a place of connection. In a healthy relationship, everyone is doing something to ensure we move towards each other. In an unhealthy relationship, all of us or one of us is moving away. Avoiding is the key word. Avoiding. Drift. Wow. <laughs> so drifting is indicative that a relationship is unhealthy. Write that down. I want to see the fastest fingers to type that out. Drifting is indicative that your relationship is unhealthy. When you drift... It's indicative that something is wrong with that relationship. Avoidance is a proof that your relationship is sick. Avoidance is also, please take note of this. Like I said, relationships are built on individual. So if the individual is emotionally sick, your, the individual is emotionally unhealthy. Watch this. The individual begins to drift. The other partner begins to exercise so much effort towards breaking the, uh, bridging the gap. But how do you bridge a gap with someone who is constantly moving away from you? What then happens is that because the individuals in the relationships are not both healthy, either the two of them or one of them, what then happens is that the relationship becomes unhealthy. It doesn't matter how good you are. Marriage is multiplication. It doesn't matter how good you are. When Sam, if Sam is, is 10, 10 and Mary is 100, when Mary marries Sam, watch this carefully. When Mary, who is 100%, marries Sam, who is 10%, watch what the result will be. 100 multiplied by 10 gives you 1,000. But imagine if Sam... Is, Mary is 100%. You are going to get where the Bible says, one will chase 1,000 and two will chase 10,000. You're going to get that now. If Sam is 100, Mary is 100. All of us are healthy. And we come into relationship together. 100 multiplied by 100, you get 10,000. So here's the point. When two healthy parties are in a relationship, what it does is that it amplifies and multiplies their results. It is therefore critical as a single person to ask yourself, who am I about to multiply myself with? Because again, watch this, 100 multiplied by zero gives you zero. 
What that means is that it doesn't matter how good you are. If you marry the wrong person, it will affect your life negatively. It matters who you marry. In the equation of destiny, you cannot be maximizing destiny when you marry somebody who minimizes you. Can I say that again? In the equation of destiny, you cannot maximize your destiny when you are married to someone who minimizes you. That is why it requires a lot of scrutiny. If you value your destiny, you will give attention to the quality of partner you invest your future into. We were not told these things. But we are privileged to be able to share that with the next generation. It's critical for you to understand that if you value your destiny, you must inquire, interrogate intentionally, make sure that you search deeply to know who you are committing your future into. Otherwise, it will minimize your life. All right? Number two, I mentioned to you that the second secret of healthy relationship is that they communicate with one another. People in healthy relationship, they communicate with one another. They talk to each other consistently. They don't avoid each other when it comes to conversation. It is something they do so very well. All right? We've been able to say also that they create the environment so that they can both listen to each other, so that they can both, what else, uh, speak, they speak, they listen, and then they negotiate. Don't forget that. These are the three things that makes for a healthy conversation. Somebody speaks, somebody listens, somebody listens, somebody speaks, and then finally we come to a baseline where we negotiate, all right? That makes for a healthy relationship. Number three, I was able to mention to you that healthy relationships in that kind of environment, they trust one another. They trust one another. They don't give each other the reason to question, doubt, distrust, or disbelieve each other or one another's commitment to the promises made or the vows that have been made. Nobody gives the other party a reason. I, I don't hold my phone in a way that makes my wife to begin to question, what, 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 what's, what's in that phone? All right? And then I don't carry my laptop and be hiding it on that bed and make my wife begin to question, what is there? Human beings are inquisitive by nature. If you create the atmosphere that actually triggers inquisitiveness, then your partner is going to become highly inquisitive. All right? Never forget that. Yes. Number four. Let's quickly move to number four. In healthy relationships and relationship environment, they honor one another. You honor one another. In healthy relationship environment, you honor one another. You regard and treat one another with utmost respect. You regard and treat one another with utmost respect. Not minding the class you all belong to. You may be a senior politician and your wife has never been around the corridors of power. Once you are married, you treat one another with utmost respect. If you choose to marry a man or a woman, whilst you are dating, you treat one another with utmost respect. You, you value what your partner values and you treat your partner's values with utmost respect. You recognize it and you respect your partner's values. You don't play, you don't downplay, you don't demean, you don't belittle, you respect one another. It is called the code of honor. I'm sure you can go back to the video of last week and watch what I, uh, the, treat, uh, the subject we dealt with, which is the code of honor. Please, I'd like you to go back and watch what men consider to be honorable and what women consider to be honorable, all right? I'd like you to quickly spend some time, maybe over this weekend, to watch that. Number five. Number five thing you can use to know that a relationship, the major indicator, major sign that a relationship is healthy. Number five is what I call empowerment. You empower one another. 
you empower one another and there are several dimensions to this number one you give each other space and you come back to share space this is how it goes you give each other space and then you come to share space you give each other space and you come to share space it's like the candle you have the wax outside and you have the thread inside all right it is a combination of the wax and the thread that makes you have light when you kindle the fire on on a candle the reason why it burns is not just because of the thread it's also because of the wax all right watch this carefully they both share space and give each other space so you can see the thread burning and you can see the wax surrounding there is a place where they share space and yet there is also a place where they give each other space every relationship that is going to be very successful is a relationship that is empowering what that means is that i give my partner the space to be him and she gives me the space to be me and then we come to, sh to share space to be us it is critical that we learn to give and share space. You learn to give and share space with one another. You allow your partner to pursue her dreams. You allow your partner to pursue his dreams, goals, interests, whatever it is that makes your partner happy. If he likes movie, you allow him. You don't attack what your partner loves. You don't attack what your partner is interested in. You don't speak badly about what your partner truly value. You empower one another. You support one another. That's part of empowerment. That your wife wants to study masters. And you're like, hey, you know what? I'm ready to give my wife some great support. You give one another maximum support. It is part of empowerment. It's critical for you to understand that when it comes to relationship, you empower one another. Never forget that. You empower one another. Number six, because of my time, we're going to be twisting it a little bit now. I guess my, my cord's breaking and, you know, but nothing to worry about. I think I just hooked it up. Yeah. So listen carefully to this. It's critical for you to understand this, that you also celebrate one another. You celebrate one another. This is very, very central to having a healthy relationship. You recognize and celebrate one another's uniqueness. You celebrate you recognize and you celebrate one another's uniqueness. It is very, very central to a very successful relationship. Highly successful and healthy relationships, they recognize and they celebrate their individual uniqueness. All right? They don't attack each other's uniqueness. They accept it. They accept the uniqueness of one another. So, so yes, my, my wife maybe likes to dance and maybe I don't like to dance. I accept the fact that that's what she loves. It's her interest and I celebrate her uniqueness. It is critical to know that you can never attack somebody's uniqueness and have the person offer you their very best. Write that down. You can never attack a partner's uniqueness and have the partner give you their maximum best in any relationship. In healthy relationship, we celebrate each other's uniqueness. We celebrate one another's uniqueness. And it begins with recognizing it. You never look at your wife and say, you talk too much. No, 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 no. That's your wife's uniqueness. And you don't look at your husband and say, you are too slow. You don't make decisions in your hurry. You are too slow. You are too slow. And you now give your husband the nickname, Baba, go slow. <laughs> right no 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 you don't talk to your husband like that your husband is likely a phlegmatic person all right who takes his time to think through before he makes a decision and you may be just a sanguine person who doesn't need to think once you have an idea it looks nice you jump into it see your husband is your balance he is your thinking person you are the talking person and if you are a choleric who is a doing person 
There your husband is your balance. He helps you to think through what you want to do. And if you're a phlegmatic person, a choleric partner is the reason why you, a thinking partner, will get a lot of things accomplished. It is about understanding each other's uniqueness, not attacking it. My wife is very pragmatic. I'm very idealistic. It is a combination of idealism and pragmatism that makes us to achieve the successes that we are achieving. She is the do it type. I'm the think it type. I like to think through. And she likes to walk through. She will be thinking it through when she's walking it through. So it, it, by virtue of the fact that we got married and allow each other to be one, just be ourselves and find a place where we both connect. Now I'm beginning to find myself to be more of a doing person, leveraging my thinking ability. And my wife is now beginning to think more before she does. You see, it's about blending. It's about giving and sharing space. It's about recognizing and celebrating our uniqueness instead of attacking each other. You don't attack your partner and say, you, you look at you. You always surround yourself with people, 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 everywhere you go, people. Eh? What kind of useless life? You, no, 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 no. You don't talk like that. Your partner is likely a sanguine person who draws energy by being with people. Let her be with her friends. If she doesn't go to be with her friends, she will not get energy to share with you. I think I'm going to do a teaching maybe sometimes next week on temperaments. So that you can see the dynamic interaction between temperaments and how it makes for solid relationships. So don't forget what I said to you uh, before now, that healthy relationships celebrate one another. You identify and appreciate one another's uh, commitment and investment into the relationship. So you don't just celebrate each other's uniqueness. You also appreciate and recognize each other's investment and commitment to the relationship. Never take that for granted. Celebrate one another. And one of the things to celebrate is uniqueness. The second thing to celebrate is commitment, investment. Your wife's time, taking care of your children. The money you provide is not what takes care of children. Is what your wife uses to take care of children. You use money, but money doesn't take care of children. You don't put money on the table and money take your children to the loo. No. Money can bath your kids. Money can't embrace your children. Money can tell your children, I love you. Money is not going to change their dresses, their diapers. No. Money provides the diapers, but somebody changes the diapers. Somebody cooks the food. Somebody keeps the house. It's important to recognize that in celebrating one another, we celebrate, number one, our uniqueness, and we also go ahead to celebrate our commitment. Celebrate your husband. That he goes to work and, and goes to, you know, make the money that he brings up. And if the two of you are working class people, celebrate each other. Celebrate one another. For the investment you are making. The sacrifices you are making. It is critical that you learn to celebrate your commitment, your investment, and celebrate also your uniqueness. Never learn to never forget to celebrate also special dates and events. It, 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 it's going to be a great crime to forget your wife's birthday. How do you explain that? So it's critical to recognize that day. And please, sir, it's not when it's around the corner, just two days to the time, that I start thinking, oh, what, what, what do I do? You plan ahead of time. You have a whole year. To plan your wife's birthday. The same thing, ma'am. Celebrate each other's special days. Your wedding anniversary, celebrate it. Find ways to celebrate. Celebrate your husband's birthday. He, he, he got promoted. Celebrate that. So learn to celebrate one another. Find creative ways. 
I'm going to say that again. Find creative ways to express your appreciations to one another. Find creative ways to do it. Number seven. In healthy relationships, they forgive one another. Write that down. In healthy relationships, they forgive one another. Let me see the fastest finger to write that down. In healthy relationships, they forgive one another. That's what happened in healthy relationship environment. You are quick to forgive. Swift to forgive. When your partner comes to ask for forgiveness, you are willing to give your partner such forgiveness. You are willing to bequeath it to your partner. You are willing to say, you know what, you can have it. And like I shared with you yesterday, please once you forgive, make a departure from the event. To err, to err is human. You are bound to make mistakes from time to time in your own life too. Don't treat your partner in a way you will not love to be treated. Don't make reference to something your partner did and ask for forgiveness if you will not want someone to make reference to the same. In essence, how you will want someone to treat you is exactly how you treat somebody else. If you don't want someone to remind you of what you've done in the past, why remind them about what they did in the past when they've asked you for forgiveness? And remember that you don't need to wait for them to come before you go to them because the Bible tells you that if you have an unforgiveness, your prayers will not be answered. So call the person and say, look, I forgive you. Whether the person asks for it or not, just say, look, you offended me and I forgive you. If the person is able to acknowledge immediately and say, I'm sorry about what I did, that's okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. And please, let me say this. Stop rehearsing and repeating past offenses. Stop rehearsing and repeating past offenses. It's very, very terrible to be repeating and rehearsing past offenses. It doesn't make for good relationship that you keep rehearsing and repeating past offenses. Just lay them where they belong, right in the grave. Is that okay or in the past? Number eight. In healthy relationship environment, they protect one another. They protect one another. You will not expose your partner to the insult of your friends. You will not in any way allow or empower your family members or your friends to speak in a manner that is derogatory, insultive, belittling demeaning to your partner you will not you will not allow that to happen you will not allow that to happen you protect one another you shield your partner from your family members you shield your partner from your friends you don't allow anybody to have a reason to insult your partner Because of our time, I need to quickly move on to number nine. You care for one another. Oh, this is beautiful. You care for one another. In healthy relationship environments, we care for one another. It is very critical. You communicate care, affection, and intimacy in such a manner that your partner will recognize and appreciate it. You communicate care. You communicate appreciation. You communicate intimacy to your partner in such a way that it lets your partner know that this is my own way of saying I love you. I have my own way of telling my wife how much I value her, how much I love her. I mean, I don't like to just talk about it. I like to show it. I like to do it. I like to, I like to buy it. I like to pay for it. So it's important for you to understand that you must find a way to communicate your love to your partner in such a way that your partner is able to internalize the understanding that what you are doing is a show of care, is a show of affection, is a show of intimacy. It is critical that you take note of that. We must learn to care for one another. And lastly, 
you must learn to pray for one another. You must learn to pray with one another. The greatest thing you must learn to do as, uh, as people in relationship is praying for one another. Here's the reason why. You can never hate someone you pray for. You see why you need to pray for one another? You can never hate anybody you truly pray for. There's something praying for one another. There's something it does to us. It kills the flesh. It kills, it kills hatred. It kills unforgiveness. Because how do you talk to God about someone you truly hate? How do you talk to God about that person? I mean, you can't fool God. If, if you want to fool yourself, you can't fool God. So when we pray for one, one another, what we do is that we increase the love that we have for each other or for one another one another so praying for one another is very very powerful and then praying with one another where we sometimes just join hands where we kneel down together however your family likes to do that you call it devotion you call it agreement there are different ways family families pray together however your family wants to do that there must be a moment where we pray with one another and there's that moment where we pray for one another. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of words. And I just wanted to know if you have a question. I decided to finish a little bit earlier today so that if there is a question you want me to respond to, I will be more than grateful to respond to it. So quickly type your question. If there is any you want me to attend to right now, you have about 60 seconds to put out your question. 60 seconds to put out your question and I will quickly attend to such a question. If you have any, uh, kindly just send me the question right now and I will try to attend to such a question. If you have a question, uh, send me the question right about now. I remember that some of you have actually sent in one or two questions. Let me see if I can access your question. Meanwhile, my my guys here will be helping me to figure out if there are questions I need to quickly attend to. And uh, we're going to do that almost immediately. If you have a question, go ahead and type out your question. And I'm sure that Caleb, who is working with me, is going to find a way to pin the question so I can get to see uh, the question. If you have a question, please go ahead and send in your question. Let me see it as soon as possible. I learned some of you wanted to ask questions yesterday, so you have that opportunity right now. Uh, do you have a question for me? YouTube? All right. I need to check up at YouTube and see where the question lies on YouTube. I'm trying to find your questions on YouTube. YouTubers... Uh, what's the question? Will it be right to invest into a courtship? Uh, this is a question from Akin. Will it be right to invest into a courtship? How much financially is advisable to invest? Akin, that question is not practically clear. Are you saying, is it okay uh, to invest? Is it into the person? Or is it okay to invest together into a business as a joint business? Well, let me say this, no, don't go into any joint venture yet when you are in courtship. Because until you are married, you are not married. If you go into a joint partnership in courtship and anything goes wrong in the relationship, one of you will suffer greatly. And trust me, when a relationship is about to break apart, people, the evil side of people really comes out. So my advice to you is, why don't you delay anything that has to do with joint investment? But if you're talking about investing into the person, for instance, if the person I want to marry wants to go and do a course and say maybe the person wants to do masters and the person is short of funds, why not? You can invest into the person with the hope that someday this person is going to be my wife. And if it turns out that the person doesn't end up as your wife, consider whatever you've invested into the person as your seed. Is that okay? And then God will bring you someone who has already finished masters, all right? 
you invested so she can finish masters and then god is bringing you someone who's already finished masters so if you have invested into a person and the person walks out of your life consider whatever you invested into the person as a seed god will bless you with someone who will become the reward for your investment all right so it all depends on what you mean by investment and i hope my answer helps you in a little bit in a little way Paul, thank you so very much. You said, Pastor Sam, you truly revolutionized my mind. All right, thank you so very much, Paul. I deeply appreciate that uh, uh, response. Thank you so very much, Paul. Uh, Neoma said, what do you do in a relationship where one of the partner is comfortable being toxic? He is proud of his toxic traits and says, this is the way I am. Deal with it. I understand that. Neoma, if you are married... Uh, I can, uh, you can't divorce him. But if you are still in a relationship, you are not married. In your mind, you don't need an angel to tell you escape for your life. I mean, that was said before. It was said to Lot, escape. In fact, when the angel was telling Lot to escape, he said, don't even bother looking back. What that means is that if whilst you used to visit him in his house, you forgot your television there or you forgot your laptop. In fact, if there are no sensitive documents in the laptop, the angel said, escape. Don't bother looking back. Don't bother about the laptop. Leave the television and walk away. Because if he's toxic and unrepentant before marriage, he is going to be more abusive when he gets married to you. So, but if you're married to the person, you can only begin to pray for him and trust God that he gets exposed to environments like this where he will be properly mentored so that he can become a better person. All right? Uh, Esther said, can unhealthy relationships be changed to a healthy one with time? Or if those unhealthy points you raise are already identified, should one end the relationship? Here is the point. If you are in relationship, you are not yet in marriage, and you discover that the points that I've men mentioned about unhealthy relationship are obvious in your relationship, here is the rule, sir confront the issue with one another say look i have this you have that are we ready to work on these things and here's my point delay the marriage if you were planning to marry in six months delay it a little bit further so that the two of you can see improvement you can see changes before you go, don't say because you fix the wedding date, you rush into wedding because you don't know how to tell people that you are shifting the date. It's better to shift the date than to run into it and come out of the wedding. You didn't want to offend the people by telling them you shifted the date. Now you're offending everybody because you've broken your marriage. So here's my point. If you identify the things that I've mentioned, here is the case. First in your own life, decide and commit yourself to making improvement. And when you want to talk to your partner, tell the person, listen to this message on unhealthy uh, signs, signs of unhealthy uh, relationship. I, and tell the person, I identify three in my own life. Please listen to it. Which one did you identify? Mention the one you identify in your life and tell the person how sorry you are that you were doing these things to the person and promise the person that you're going to commit yourself to improvement, okay? You see, when you take the lead by saying, I identify this error in my life, I identify where I've been hurting you, and I have made up my mind to be committed to changing. When you do that, what you do is that you have empowered your partner to also change. And you've also empowered your partner to take up the initiative to recognize and commit himself or herself to a process of change. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, I think I still have some questions on YouTube. Reverend, please, what should a woman do whose husband packed his luggage and left home? <laughs> I'm so sorry, honestly, it just makes me laugh. Sometimes the way some men behave, you know, God have mercy. Hello, ma'am, because I do not have the details of this matter, it is difficult for me to give a blanket answer to this. Why did he leave home? What could have left, led a man to carry his luggage? You said he left with luggage. To carry luggage and leave his matrimonial home. 
uh, ma'am, the details are not available here. Therefore, uh, it's going to be very difficult to deal with this. Because, for instance, if the reason why he left home is that he's more of a quiet person, very thoughtful, lost a peaceful environment, if he's such a man, and you are too much of a talking, nagging person, now he is going to leave, and if he's been telling you most times, men don't just leave home like that. They've been leaving clues. Women, write that word down, clues. Whenever a man finally leaves a house, please remember he's been leaving clues. He's been saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it. The issue sometimes with, I'm sorry women, God bless you, you're such fantastic people. The issue sometimes that you're not giving attention to the clues that men are leaving. Until finally when it happens, you're like, but, but is that enough for you to leave? That's enough for him to leave. So please, ma'am, I don't know the details, but a man will not just leave. What is going on sexually between two of you? What is going on conversationally between two of you? How much of an intellectual compatible partners are you? When he's talking about business, career, what language are you speaking? Emotionally, don't forget what I told you before. Is it possible that maybe you were drifting or he was drifting and somebody didn't give attention to it? There's a whole lot of reasons why that can be a reality. If he's gone home, and if he's left the house, and you realize, ma'am, that you have a part to play. My professor will always tell me, he said, you never have a conflict situation where both parties did not make a contribution. Professor Hernandez said that to me. I will never forget when he said that to me in California. He said, Sam, you never have a conflict situation where both parties did not make a contribution. If there's a conflict situation, both parties made a contribution. So, ma'am, I will want to say, identify where you went wrong and then go after him and say, I recognize where I went wrong. And don't bother talking about, but you too, it's because you did this. No, 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 no. Just talk about yours. Admit where you went wrong. And let's trust that that will perhaps begin to soften his heart. So, there are several reasons why, um, you know, men exit their families. Uh, do I have, I don't know if there's things coming up on Facebook, but I think I still have questions. Do you encourage the, okay. Somebody's asking me, blessing. You are asking if I can encourage distant dating. Okay. For all of you who are into distant dating, here's what I want to say. Normal dating requires certain level of commitment to make it work. Distant dating requires twice the energy. Twice the commitment to make a normal dating relationship work. So the question is, are you ready to put in the work? Number two, you never know who an individual is truly when you are dating from afar. You never know who an individual is because on Facebook, everybody looks good. On video, everybody puts out their best uh, you know, foot forward. So you never know who you are marrying, who you are dealing with when you are dating from afar. It is when you come close that you begin to see who the person truly is. So dating, yes, can be the beginning of a relationship, but it must not be the end of it. Meaning, it must not be on the basis of a distant dating that you finally make a decision to marry a person. I hope that helps you. Uh, let me see. Oops, oops, oops. Femi Ajayi. How will you handle a wife that won't say sorry? <laughs> How would you handle a wife that won't say sorry despite the fact that she knew she's wrong in her decision but to say sorry becomes too weighty for her? I can tell you why. I, I can tell you straight why. The reason why most women find it difficult to say sorry is because they feel it is humiliating. And the reason is because when they were growing up, they were humiliated. So the, the fear of not being humiliated again makes them, th there's something about women who are humiliated. Check any woman who was humiliated growing up. You will find this common indicator, except where Jesus, Jesus has really dealt with her. Any woman that grew up in a background where she was humiliated, 
Number one, check. She will always want to be controlling, asserting, and she will always want to be domineering. The reason is, this is an opportunity for her now to silence the voices that spoke against her when she was young. You see, it's a subconscious thing. She doesn't know how traumatized and how emotionally uh, messed up she is. And that's because mostly in our own part of the world, emotional traumas are not issues we talk about. People who are, who are emotionally damaged are on the loose. We walk to the altar, we say, I do. We don't even know who we are. And immediately after the wedding, somebody carries a bottle and breaks on the other person. All of a sudden, the man is wondering, you have this level of anger? Yes, she had it. It's just that she's not been stressed to the point where she expresses it. So the reason why some women find it difficult to say sorry is because sometimes they see it internally. How am I going to say sorry? Something inside them tells them that it's taking them back to where they came from. Some other women, the reason they don't say sorry it's not because of pride, arrogance, or their background. It's because they don't even know how to say sorry. So there are several reasons why women find it difficult to say sorry. Here's what I'm going to say to you, sir. Don't discountenance your wife because she finds it difficult to say sorry. Help her. In fact, sir, you may need to listen to her story so that you can understand her attitude, so that you can understand her behavior. It might be tied to her background. It might be tied to her experiences in life. All right? So don't try away. Work with her and you may get to find out the reason why she is acting the way she is acting. Okay. Wow. Our time is... Oh, my, my, my. I'm just going to take one more. Connie, ask a question. Man of God, Reverend Sam, is it advice, advisable to build up a relationship with a person you never met before? More so on the long distance. Thank God. Thank God. And God richly bless you. Okay, thank you. And God richly bless you. And all of that. I think I just answered that question right now. So my husband to be has his fault. And I have mine. But you are really helping us as we are truly improving on ourselves. Absolutely. When you become better, your relationship becomes better. It is sad. How can a man who is the head of a family leave his house? They do, please. And there's a reason why. Please, before you judge a man for leaving his house understand what's going on in the house the bible says in the book of proverbs it is better to stay in the wilderness than to be in the same house with a nagging wife did you hear that so there are reasons why some men leave home and please before we judge him let's get the brother picture let's get to know what's really transpired in his marriage my time is gone and i must stop right about now i love you we will connect on monday and i think we may have to do a lot of question and answers on monday so let's see if we can do a 30 minutes uh, uh session on monday and do question and answer and then the next day also we do the same thank you so very much I deeply appreciate you. Can't wait to have you tomorrow morning, 5.50 a.m. West African time for the prophetic prayer hour. What a time we had today. Tomorrow is a day of prayer for your family, family members, your friends. Uh, tomorrow we're trusting God for the anointing and the grace for enlargement. And we're going to engage every force, every power that is hindering your enlargement. And we're decreeing that God will increase your greatness. If you want to see God increase your greatness, Make sure you set your alarm to be awake at 5.50 a.m. West African time when we all come together and pray. Until I come your way next week for this Relationship Masterclass, this is Samuel saying keep on keeping on. Bye-bye.